I became interested in reading for the bar when I was 15 um, because I got a crush on a young barrister who lived round the corner from me where I lived in Bolton. But then I got a bit of a setback because I was at a careers lecture at school and there was a government careers office there and at the end of, the, of his talk um, I asked him what you had to do to become a barrister and his answer went something like this. Is your father a solicitor? No. Have you got perhaps an uncle who's a solicitor? No. Have you got any male relations in the law? No. I'd give it a miss if I were you. The law is a man's world. Um, anyway, I got into Newnham and then, <clears throat> this is where the embarrassing bit comes in, I got pregnant. Now, in those days, that was so disgraceful that um, Newnham uh, w w would never have... I mean, the headmistress just wrote and said she won't be coming, um, but that's, they wouldn't have had me anyway. So I uh, didn't go anywhere. I didn't go to university. I got married. I had that baby, followed by two more. Interestingly, the man I told you I'd had a crush on who was still a friend. He and my husband and I were all walking along the pavement in Manchester on our way to the theatre. It was my 28th birthday, I remember it well. And my husband, I was walking slightly behind them, and my husband turned to Michael and said, don't you think it would be a good idea if Janet went to the bar? And Michael, without either of them looking at me, looked at my husband and said, you know, that's a really good idea. I can't think why we never thought of it before. And it was a real dushy take sugar moment. <laughs> and instead of being cross with them, I thought, what a brilliant idea. <laughs> and from that moment, my, my future was set. I did my first two years of bar exams by correspondence courses. It's not ideal, I tell you, uh, but I did. Um, it, it was suited, it was, it, it made life easier for me because <clears throat> I could look after the children. I used to get up, at, get them off to school, dash back, and um, disappear into the dining room, which became my study for all purposes, other than when we had lots of people for dinner, and um, work until I had to fetch the children home from school. About quarter past three, I would pack everything up and dash off. And then I couldn't do anything in school holidays, obviously. But I did my first year of my first set of bar exams. It took me 15 months. It should only take nine months. But I was very slow because it was a... It was like learning a foreign language, really, um, without any help. Because I didn't have anybody to talk to. And, um, but I did like it right from the start. I knew I'd found my thing. In those days, Chambers made no allowances at all for a woman barrister who might have family responsibilities. Uh, I just had to make my own arrangements, which included uh, paying f to have somebody to be a background for the children. They were old enough not to need positive looking after all the time, but there had to be a presence in the house. My husband was often there because he had an office in the house. But uh, obviously he would be busy and wouldn't have time to uh, attend to them. I took silk in 1986. I was 14 years cool, which is quite a short period as a junior barrister. By that time I was 45. But of course, if you're, if you're that bit older when you start, you do get off to a faster beginning. Um, you look a bit more mature. People think you are more mature and more experienced than you really are, and that helps. So I got off to quite a, a, an early start, really. By the time I had taken Silk, my work was 90% uh, personal injury and clinical negligence. And it's an area of law that I always enjoyed. First of all, I had been brought up in it by my pupil master, 
But it's an area of law that I think is very important. It affects a great number of people, a great proportion of the population. Um, people who have injuries at work uh, or suffer a disease as a result of the conditions in which they've been working, or they have road traffic accidents, or something goes wrong with medical treatment uh, that they undergo, or dental treatment. And you would be surprised um, at how much work there is in that field. My first experience of an inquiry was when I was a silk. It was not long before I went on the High Court bench, but I was a silk in Manchester, and I was asked to chair an inquiry into some things that had gone badly wrong at a small school for autistic children in Lancaster. It lasted about nine months. Uh, it was very good experience for me um, for doing a public inquiry because I later did a much bigger one. In fact, I hadn't finished writing that judge, the, the report in the um, Scotford House inquiry when I had a telephone call from the Lord Chancellor's department. In those days, that's how it happened. You didn't apply, you didn't fill in any forms, you just got a telephone call. And I thought it was because I hadn't replied to an invitation to the, um, the Abbey service uh, because I'd been so busy, I hadn't bothered, I hadn't replied. And uh, so I rang the secretary, his secretary up and said, I'm terribly sorry, I would like to come to the Abbey service on the 1st of October. I'm awfully sorry I haven't replied. She said, it's not that he wants to speak to you. I wasn't at all sure that I wanted to do it because it would mean leaving my home in the north and being based mainly in London, uh, and meant it meant not living very much with my husband. Um, so I wasn't at all sure that I wanted it. But to tell you the truth, I thought that if anybody found out that a woman had been offered the High Court bench and had refused, I mean, there were only about two at that time, that if anybody had refused, it would look, it would look awful. So I bent my neck to the yoke and said yes, it's really very odd because the whole of your career at the bar, you have become more and more specialised. And the minute you become a judge, you are a generalist by definition. And the first session you do, this is pretty well the same for everybody, is in the crim criminal, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. And I hadn't been a criminal specialist at all. Um, I'd done a bit, but not much. And then after that, you're sent out on circuit and you find yourself trying murder cases and things like that. So it is a bit of a shock to the system. Um, but everybody was very helpful. First of all, counsel are terribly helpful. They don't want you to make a mess of it. They want to help you get it right. And other judges are very helpful too. So you, you learn to swim in the deep end quite quickly. There were two judges who were very unpleasant to me. There was also a judge that tried to make a pass at me in lodgings. That was very unpleasant. Listening to the families uh, was at times very distressing. Uh, but you know, judges do get used to that. Um, there were one or two moments when I had to put my head down because my eyes were prickly. The inquiry was much longer than it was supposed to be because the government originally didn't want me to find out who Shipman had killed. They wanted me just to look at the, um, the system's failures, the failures of the coroner's system, the death certification, um, the monitoring of doctors, the, the way in which we regulate controlled drugs. They wanted those things to be looked, or, looked at. But as soon as I got to Manchester, I realised that what the people in Manchester wanted, or the people in Hyde wanted, was for me to find out who Shipman had killed, because there were a lot of families that were suspicious about it, but their cases hadn't been investigated at all. 
So I decided I was going to do that. I made a lot of recommendations and also there was a general f sense in the profession that the culture of the profession had to change. It had to become more patient orientated rather than doctor orientated. So I think my recommendations came at a time when change was already in the air and I gave them a push in the right direction but I can't really claim credit for having instigated all of those changes. I think a lot of them would have happened anyway but I pushed them along. I had never thought that I would be a judge, actually. I had always thought that starting late, it would be impossible to catch up and ever have any kind of judicial career, um, but obviously I did. I didn't expect to be a High Court judge. I certainly didn't expect to get into the Court of Appeal. I do think that having been a woman was a great advantage, because by the time I was in the frame for judicial appointment, uh, the powers that be had definitely reached the stage of wanting to appoint women. In 2011, I decided to retire and became treasurer of Lincoln's Inn in 12, carried on sitting in the Court of Appeal part-time, which was very nice and I was very happy doing. And then in late 2012, I was just coming to the end of my stint as treasurer when the Jimmy Savile scandal broke and the BBC asked me if I would do what they called a review but was really an inquiry into what he had been doing in connection with his work at the BBC. <clears throat> so that seemed a good thing to do because uh, I could see it was going to be full time for I thought maybe a year, 18 months. And that was interesting work and I, so I said yes. And for a time after that, I didn't do, I didn't sit in the Court of Appeal at all, although I did finish that and go back to sitting in the Court of Appeal until I dropped off the, um, I dropped off my perch through being too old. And then when you're 75, you can't sit in the Court of Appeal at all. But then there are plenty of other things you can do, like going to Gibraltar, where they don't mind how old you are. And so I'm in the Court of Appeal of Gibraltar. And... A lot of retired judges now do mediation and arbitration, and I do a bit of mediation, but I also do a thing called neutral evaluation, which is another form of alternative dispute resolution. And I shall, God willing, my health holds up, I shall carry on working at least until I'm 80, but maybe a little after that.